The following contains spoilers for many of the world-building elements found in Lobotomy Corporation and a few vague hints about elements that will come up in Library of Ruina. Also, the entirety of Wonder Lab, but that should be pretty obvious at this point. I will say that this is a free webcomic that you could probably read in a day, as it's very light on word count, doesn't have too many chapters, and is a good time in general. I know this is like telling you not to watch this video, but trust me, it's worth your time. Link in the description. Also, we should talk about something I normally don't bring up here. Pronouns! Mimi, the comics creator, never assigns any particular gender to their characters here. I'll be trying my best to retain this original intent by using gender neutral language, but many of these characters are certainly coded one way or the other, so forgive me if a he or she slips through the editing. Anyway, all that aside, come, take a step off the edge, and join me down the rabbit hole. I've been waiting to use this introduction for a while now, and this seems to be the most appropriate place, so here we go. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a great dark forest. People lived among its trees in a state of half-sleep, wandering to and fro with nary a thought in their head. But things lurked beneath the heavy boughs of the trees, things with evil eyes and gnashing teeth. It was the job of some of the people to keep these things locked away in cages of steel and bone. But the more they kept the monsters, the more they awoke from their slumber to see the world as it was. Some turned and ran from the monsters, and were cut down in their panic. Some broke at the revelation, twisting, morphing, and changing into monsters themselves. But others... Welcome back to Lobotomy Corporation. This is a threat. Well, a branch office of the corporation. The story of the main branch has already been told. Welcome specifically to branch office 05681. It operates pretty differently than the main branch. First off, instead of the wonderful and not at all terrifying please don't hurt me assistant Angela, we instead have the holographic manual assisting the manager here. Additionally, there are only five departments as opposed to the nine of the main branch. The manager is much less hands-on here and instead leaves the heads of the various teams to handle the day-to-day -day running of the facility. The heads aren't the main focus of our story, but we should talk about them anyway as a few of them are significant. That and their designs are cool. First, we have the head of the control team, Joe, the head of the safety team, BB, the head of the information team. I do apologize. It seems we're undergoing some form of containment breach. Anyway, here's Daisy, head of the training team, and Shasha, head of the disciplinary team. Our story mostly follows disciplinary. They've unfortunately experienced a TPK at the hands of an abnormality named Hookah Caterpillar. So, to get back up to full operating power, they're borrowing agents from the rest of the facility. One such agent with actual experience is Agent Parker, who is one of our major characters. They walk around abusing clerks like A intended, showing their fellow employees around and... Well, unfortunately, it seems like Parker has forgotten one of the most important rules of working in the Lobotomy Corporation. Every abno is dangerous. Meet Cat. They're far from a clerk. In fact, they're the only employee from the disciplinary team to survive the Hook of Caterpillar crisis. And they're the real major character in the story. Turns out that the abno that the group visited initially is called Dingle Dangle, and it causes vivid hallucinations. Poor Parker apparently didn't get the message to their inevitable downfall. Okay, let's stop being granular and start talking generally. This story is largely about Cat's development as a character. Two other characters come in to be a part of it, but Cat is by far the main lead as their emotional development sets the tone and the pacing for everything around it. Where we see them here, they're a callous individual that will dunk on their lower ranked employees for seemingly no reason. They don't socialize, but they're really good at suppressing both employees and abnormalities when anything goes wrong. So they're essentially a hyper-competent badass that's emotionally distant. Not a new character archetype by any means, but Wonder Lab handles them well. Let's meet our other two leads before we get much deeper. Firstly, we have Rose, the scion to a high-ranking feather in one of the wings. They realize at a young age that the wings are far from the paradise of peaceful plenty that they paint themselves to be. They realize this after climbing to a high building and looking out into the back streets to see a kid eating rotten mush out of a can. Thankfully, they saw easily the worst thing that happens in the back streets. Yup. Doesn't get much worse than eating some slightly off food for survival. Anyway, they're determined to break down the currently existing system of wings and to make a wing that accepts everyone equally. We also have Ty. They're originally a counseling clerk there to help other employees not lose their minds during work, but after they're forced to kill one of their patients in self-defense during an abno suppression, they're assigned to work in the disciplinary team, a job to which they take surprisingly well. They experience some initial difficulties with an abno named Tangle, who seems all kinds of friendly, but like all abnos, they eventually go sicko mode and try to kill whoever is working on them. A story formula that the comic might lean on too hard in the earlier portions, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Anyway, Ty comes to realize that abnos are made of unbridled instinct and emotion, and you can't be friends with a physical manifestation of schizophrenia. Okay, now that you're aware of the main characters, we need to quickly cover a few things I missed talking about during the LobCorp video. Specifically, we need to cover ego. See, in LobCorp, when an employee worked on an abnormality, they would gain points. After gaining enough of these points, the manager could make ego equipment, which are basically weapons and armor based off the abnormalities that borrowed their strengths and weaknesses. For instance, if an abno was weak to physical damage and strong against mental damage, their weapon would likely deal mental damage 
damage and their armor would grant the same resistances. Oh, also, if you equip an ego that outscales your capability, you suffer from ego corrosion. It's a very, very minor detail here since it's only detrimental with prolonged use, but it's going to be extremely relevant in a later title. There are also the different colors of damage from Lob Corp, but those don't really serve much of an actual story purpose in the Greater Project Moon series, so we're gonna just ignore them except for a few casual mentions. Oh, there's also a few other minor characters that should be mentioned for the sake of completion. There's Finn, not that one, who grew up working with an organization called a Syndicate, which we won't go into too much detail here, but just know that they're not the nicest people around. They're really good at suppression, but absolutely awful at working with abnormalities. We've also got Ella, who is the only employee from the intro chapter who decided to stick around after Parker got banished into irrelevancy. Finally, we have Flower, a cute, upbeat gremlin who is a shocking beacon of positivity in the darkness of the corporation. Flower and Ty even get together and start asking the heads for a branch-wide improvement of a stat that will help keep employees safe when working with certain abnos. They're rejected by everyone, but hey, they're positive enough to try. This is also where we start getting more character input from Shasha, the disciplinary head. They give Flower and Finn a talk about how the stat never really needs to be improved for the other teams, because the entire point of disciplinary is that if things go wrong, they'll fix it. This becomes important for Ty's character later on down the line. Okay, one last bit of exposition and we can actually start summarizing things again. Wonder Lab introduces a concept called aberrations, which are spin-offs from normal abnormalities. None of these existed in LobCorp, and they tend to be weaker than their original, with one major exception that we'll get to. They're mostly just here so the writer can put their own spin on certain abnos, which is cool. Now, the main plot really gets started with a pair of abnos themed after Wizard of Oz named The Road Home and Scaredy Cat. The Road Home, aka Dorothy, has apparently been watching too much Gundam as she performs a colony drop by dunking a house on a random point in the facility when she breaches. She and Scaredy Cat will then proceed to head towards the crater, and if they get there, something happens. We never really learn what. Also, Scaredy Cat is a terrified little kitty when it's in containment, and a terrifying manticore when it breaks out. Naturally, both of these spend all of five minutes in the facility before breaching. Cat corners the two abnos as they do some teleportation gimmick, although, unfortunately, Rose and Ty stumble into the room at the same time. The two friends manage to hold Scaredy Cat at bay through their combined efforts, while Cat throws hands with Road Home. Normally, Cat would dumpster this literal child, but Road Home says some weird things to Cat that screws up their mental, which results in them losing the fight until Ty shows up as backup. Ty manages to set Cat up to successfully suppress Road Home, which turns Scaredy Cat back into a little kitten. Cat, after experiencing a moment of vulnerability, tries to spook Ty and Rose by talking about tearing off Road Home's skin. They both say it would be cool to see Cat in a new ego, which is just kind of hilarious. Sorry, Cat, you can't scare these two anymore. They've seen enough shit that you making nasty comments is just kind of expected at this point. At the end of this arc, Road Home finds itself back in its containment cell, but thinks on the interesting person it met when it broke out. She specifically calls Cat the friend that leaves for the Wonderland. Meanwhile, Cat is overlooking the dread abno that started this whole thing, Hookah Caterpillar. To condense down a lot of exposition, the Caterpillar can either be fed or starved. If it gets fed, it produces a ton of energy, but it eventually pulls a GLaDOS and fills the facility with neurotoxins. Currently, it's being starved. The higher-ups will have to eventually demand that people go and start feeding it because corporate greed or something. Also, the feeding involves experiencing past traumas related to being complacent, so that's fun. This exposition is mostly delivered by Cat to the rest of the disciplinary characters we know, who react less with despair at their inevitable hardship and more with a desire to improve themselves to survive when it hits them, which is a neat detail showing how these characters have become pretty experienced in the short time they've been in disciplinary. Anyway, the heads start to think of a fix for the Caterpillar problem. They decide to make new egos and to consider bringing in some outsourced problem solvers, let's call them. Cat plays a prank, breaking Ty and Rose's ego outfits and giving them the Caterpillar ones. Oh, also Rose is experiencing some real bad kickback from working with Caterpillar due to their history as a spoiled brat chilling in the status quo. Weirdly though, Ty also experiences the stress of working with Caterpillar, but constantly gets bad work results. Eventually it breaks containment while Rose is working with it and things get bad. Smoke fills the corridors and people die in droves, but the disciplinary crew is able to resist the worst of its effects for a time due to their neurotoxin-resistant egos. Ty shows up to get Rose out of there, but Rose is almost unresponsive. However, Cat barely manages to tackle them through a door before the entire department is sealed off and the rabbits show up! Yeah! Meongus gets a cameo appearance before the rabbits fill the caterpillar with enough lead to make a 40k orc blush. This returns it to its less terrifying form and things calm down. However, after Cat starts prodding Rose in their normal way, Rose responds by straight up punching them. Cat almost kills them, but Rose screams that if Cat could excise their pain and their feelings, they would gladly die right then and there. Cat responds with a 6P, then walks off. After this, we flash back to when Cat first joined the disciplinary team. They were super nervous and really quiet back then, but found a role model in this big... Alright, listen, I know I said I was gonna go the gender neutral route for most of this, but I'm making an executive decision to call this one a lady because I already finished Dora Hey Doro and need more big women in my life. Consider this a gender grappler rather than a gender neutral. Anyway, this big lady becomes Kat's inspiration to get through the worst parts of the corporation. Kat doesn't take too well to the stresses of the corporation. They see their favorite large lady beating someone, but come to terms with that being the natural role of the disciplinary team. They're given work on an extremely low-level abno called Bottle of Tears so they can adjust. Any work can be done on it, so long as the employee doesn't eat the cake that's corking the bottle. 
However, because anything can be done with the bottle, Kat winds up vending to it, talking about their fears of seeing the nice people they work with losing their shit, hurting themselves, and the things around them. Even Shasha winds up taking a permanent scar on the line of duty, meaning that no one is safe. After seeing such terrible things, Kat can't even walk around the street and look at the smiling faces of the people in the nest, so they move into the on-site dormitory. They wind up praying to the camera that the manager watches from, begging for a strong heart that can face all the darkness of the facility. They want to be like their inspiration, but that same inspiration breaks one day and starts beating her fellow employees before being killed. This breaks Cat. They believe that they found the meaning of the facility. The only way to survive is to abandon reason and protect the self. Cat breaks into the bottle of tears containment unit and eats the cake, causing the room to flood. They float aimlessly in the water, yet stand outside the unit, holding the ego weapon of the bottle. Okay, I know I normally save more critical stuff for later on in the video, but I just want to talk about how incredibly cool this entire sequence is. Cat's characterization thus far has been really interesting, initially coming off as the fairly obvious jerk with the heart of gold trope, but evolving well past it as time goes on. Yeah, they're still kind of that trope, but they they have a really good reason for being so abrasive. They're trying to maintain the one strategy that they've found which lets them survive in the facility, or the Wonderland as they call it. Yet we see this strategy falter as Rose and Ty continue to stick around despite all of the dangers they face. They still have their hearts as Cat would put it, and they're getting stronger because of it. This combined with the inevitable human urge to form attachments to other humans causes them to slowly but surely come out of their shell as the series continues. It's such a natural and progressive process that's such a joy to read. Oh, one thing I should point out before we continue is that Cat is constantly goofing off in their private time. They do morning calisthenics and watch old-timey cartoons, but most importantly, they constantly seem to be glancing at the cameras the manager uses to watch over the facility. They're always aware of them, even if no other characters actively acknowledge them. There's religious angles for this too, as they pray to the camera a few times, establishing the manager as a godlike figure for those that work in the facility. Oh, we should also talk about that weird last scene where Cat is both drowning in the bottles room and outside at the same time. I think this is mostly symbolic, as it represents Cat killing off their heart, as they put it. I'm not sure if Cat ever actually ate the cake, I think they mostly just did it symbolically. Anyway, moving on, we start the arc dealing with the final magical girl. See, during Lobotomy Corporation, there's three magical girl abnormalities you can get in your facility, with a fourth one implied to exist and something terrible implied to happen if they all breach at the same time. However, the last one was cut due to time constraints. Something similar happened with Roadholm and Scaredy Cat. Unfortunately, like Roadholm and Scaredy Cat, we don't see what happens when all the members get together, but we do at least get an introduction to our final magical girl, the Servant of Wrath. After the three other girls breach containment in a different, unrelated, and incredibly screwed facility, Facility, Wrath doesn't go join them purely because of their friendship with an employee named Beozi in O5681. Beozi has this weird mental where they believe friendship is the mutual exploitation of two different people. While from a psychological standpoint they're not strictly speaking wrong, they're really aggressive about it for reasons we'll see later. For now, they're trying to get Kat to hang out with them because Kat is the strongest captain in the facility aside from them. Also, Kat and Rose make up with Kat even saying nice things. Beozi eventually starts losing control over the Servant of Wrath, and their department head demands that they hand over the ego gift that they got from Servant of Wrath. Unfortunately, this gift is a symbol of Beozi's friendship with Wrath, which they interpret as improving their own self-worth because it makes them strong. They believe that the only way to survive in the facility is to be strong and to be surrounded by strong friends to exploit, which is why they react so poorly to being asked to take some time off. They hand over the gift in a fuss, only for it to turn out that it was just a fake toy that they had gotten their hands on. Beozi flees to Wrath's containment cell where they suffer a breakdown. Wrath also has a breakdown, but since she's an abnormality, this results in some, uh, unfortunate things happening. Beozi is consumed by the ego gift they wear, vanishing in its embrace with a smile. So the story of Servant of Wrath is that they're an arbiter of justice, however they were tricked by a hermit from another world into treating them like a friend. This hermit betrayed that friendship to destroy everything that Wrath loved, which caused her to transform into a monstrous incarnation of Kathy the comic strip character in order to get vengeance. Beozi is transformed into this hermit, who then proceeds to go around and turn low-level employees into headless dolls so the servant can have something to fight. Wrath is only suppressed if they are the one to deliver the final blow to the hermit. Cat, Rose, and Ty show up to handle the suppression, but swiftly find themselves outgunned. They retreat when the department heads show up to the fight. There's some weird pacing stuff where the hermit strikes a really heavy blow to the servant and everyone treats it like it has any kind of consequence, but things are quickly resolved when the servant properly bonks the tar out of the hermit. As things calm down, Kat remarks that Beozi was an idiot who attached silly meanings to a silly thing. Ty responds that the meaning someone puts on a thing just shows what kind of person they are. It's not stupid or silly. Kat responds by knocking them on the head because they've been caught out. Really quickly here, I'm normally very positive when it comes to this comic, but the pacing during the breakdown with servant is really weird, specifically the moment when Beozi hands over the fake gift. The other captain she hands the quote-unquote gift to almost immediately realize it's a fake and go to chase them. It's weird because why is there a toy that looks almost exactly like this ego gift? Where did Beozi get something like that from? And how in the world did the captains not catch up to Beozi if they realize this dupe almost immediately? It's implied that Beozi has spent more than like 10 seconds in the containment unit when we cut to them in servant, so how in the world didn't the captains interfere with Beozi's trauma dump session? Oh, obviously it's because the breach needs to happen, but there definitely was a better way to go about it. Maybe have the fake gift brought 
in for testing, showing that enough time has passed for Bayozu to get to Wrath's containment unit, and then for the breach to happen. This isn't a major flaw, it just ties into a complaint that I have about the series that we'll get into later. Since Ty and Rose are getting fairly strong, and Cat is the juggernaut they've always been, management decides to send them to a joint workshop with another facility. There's a lot of good scenes here dealing with the trio warming up to each other, and we'll talk about those, but first let's get the basic and kind of unimportant plot out of the way. There's some cool ALF tier aberrations of Nothing There in Fairy Festival, they're called No One Is and Titania. No One Is is a mirror stuck in the middle of a lump of flesh that tries to imitate a single individual instead of just general humanity like Nothing There, while Titania is actively hunting down an entity called Oberon, who she believes stole her kids or something. There's also a character that hits on Rose, and that being a mood aside, they do it really heavy-handed and kinda weird. Inevitably, the aberrations breach on the first night of the workshop. The group finds some ALF tier ego suits to use based on the two spooky aberrations. The weird flirty character buys time for them to get away, winds up getting eaten by No One Is, the newly completed No One Is accepts the name of Oberon from Titania, they fuse together into a super ALF or something, Cat throws Ty through a window, and none of this is ever really brought up again. Now let's talk about the important stuff from this arc. Character building. Over the course of this bit, Cat, Ty, and Rose all share a lot of character building moments together. Cat has pretty openly accepted the other two as people at this point, lowering most of their barriers to them. They're now actively considered friends. Rose talks about her life goals, Cat mentions wanting to see the sea at some point, and Ty mentions living by the ocean. They even have a dorm room together and plan on watching movies and eating sweets. However, most of these fun, totally not necessarily girls' night moments get cut short by the breach. Thankfully, the next chapter basically exists solely for the sake of getting those cute moments to happen. There's a new Abno in the facility. It's a twin pair of sisters who whisper rancid Korean-specific vibes to whoever is in the room with them. However, once you leave, their vibes kind of fall off. They always need someone listening to them or they breach, including at night. So the three get together and decide to have a sleepover at the facility so Kat doesn't have to hang out with the abnormality alone at night. The three of them have a talk about their lives, Rose discussing how they've always found guidance from movies, Ty talking about the wonder of diving into the ocean, and Kat mentioning how all they've ever done is survive. Ty says that survival is the best thing a person could do. Life might seem pointless at times, but we all leave something behind when we go. Because we live, we never truly vanish even if we die. Rose says that their happy cat is alive. Cat drifts off into a peaceful sleep, before jerking awake sometime later with Rose and Ty gone. They look up in a panic, only to see them sitting elsewhere, a ton of coffee next to them, sleeping. They were working and trying not to wake Cat up. Cat feels relieved, and considers what perishes, yet does not. There's also this really important shot here of a bottle in the ocean, which calls back to Bottle of Tears, which is representative of Cat's choice to rip their own heart out. Alright, this next section is cool, but basically serves as a more action-oriented example of the previous chapter's character building. Our final aberration of the series is introduced and it's a spin on Little Red Riding Hood and Mercenary and Big and Will Be Bad Wolf. This is Blue Smocked Shepherd and Redded Buddy. Basically, the Shepherd is a complete asshole that wants a wolf to fight, so he constantly tortures his dog so he eventually turns into a wolf. Rose tries to comfort the dog, who inevitably turns into a wolf and breaches. Rose gets eaten during the altercation, but is saved by Cat, while Ty puts Shepherd into the fucking ground, as is deserved. While recovering from their wounds, Rose expresses how powerless they felt caring for the dog who loyally put up with the pain for the sake of his master's cruel happiness. Ty insists that Rose isn't helpless and is in fact extremely strong now. Even Cat says that Rose is far from helpless. If they're this good at dealing with the evil of abnormalities, normal evil humans will be nothing for them to deal with in the future. If only they knew. Cat doesn't even flinch away after saying this, showing great growth on their part. These scenes are so good, specifically because of what it means for Cat. Ty and Rose were always the lessers to Cat for a long time, but after all the stuff they've been through, they're quickly closing the gap between them. Cat reacts to this in a strange way. These are two people who are surviving and thriving without Cat's mentality of abandoning reason to survive. They're thriving because of each other, and not because they're shutting themselves off from each other. In fact, Kat's entire viewpoint is slowly being broken down by these two. Ty specifically puts a huge crack in it with their comment about how surviving is sometimes the most important thing a person can do. The residue of a life lived, even if not well or grandiosely, is still important because it touches the lives of those who come after it. Kat has thrived off of this nihilistic abandonment of their sense of self, but Ty's message here serves to show that it's not endless survival that matters, it's the things that you do while you're alive. Even the things they lost, like their old friends from before the Caterpillar, and it still had meaning because Cat lived on, and abandoning that meaning is like abandoning their sacrifice. And so, Cat feels a call to take up their heart once more, to embrace these feelings of love, and to move on past their trauma. However, love is precisely the thing that our next abnormality feeds on more than anything else. The Piscean Mermaid is based on the original legend of the Little Mermaid. The Little Mermaid was a monster that loved a human prince, but she could never truly love him because she wasn't human. She died in agony after ripping her fin in half to try and mimic legs, only being seen by the prince as a monster. She didn't even have a 
soul, so instead of going to heaven or hell after death, she simply turned into sea foam and faded into nothing. Yeah, that's not even the abnormality story, that's just Hans Christian Andersen being a fucked up goblin man. Love him for that. Anyway, the Piscean Mermaid is a dangerous abnormality. It wants nothing more than a heart to love with. It does this by offering a fine comb to the one working with it. If the worker accepts, it breaches. They deny it by dumping the mental state of your average competitive multiplayer gamer on the mermaid, presumably causing it great pain. Cat starts working with the mermaid. They seem to believe it is a good way to prove their own worldview, that love and emotions have no root in their heart, so it should be very easy to work with the mermaid. However, just like with Ty and Rose, the love creeps in and nearly kills them. They pick up the comb and put it in their hair, causing the mermaid to breach. However, in a fit of rage, Cat retaliates and almost completely butchers the mermaid. The entire disciplinary team gathers in the aftermath. Rose goes to comfort Cat, but they scream that no one should ever get close to them again before stalking off, covered in blood. I know I've said this a few times, but this chapter is fantastic. Cat creates their own self-fulfilling prophecy here. They're so determined to prove that their past mentality is true, it's superior, it's the only way to really survive here. And in this instance, that's absolutely true. The only way to survive the mermaid is to reject its desired love at all times. But as we've seen repeatedly throughout the series, Cat slips up. Their isolationist mentality has been cracking for the entire comic, and one of those cracks is just enough to have a moment of weakness. So Cat now firmly believes that these feelings they've developed are wrong. They're an evil weakness that they can't afford if they're going to survive in the facility. So Cat tries to cut off all their connections with Ty and Rose by avoiding them as much as possible. However, when tragedy looms, isolation is the last thing a person needs. A new abnormality arrives at the facility, one that terrifies all of the department heads. It is the Staining Rose, a strange abnormality with an extremely specific routine. Certain employees fulfill a condition. Only one of those employees can work on it. Slowly, the rose fills up with color. Once it's full, it goes on a long time without needing to be worked on. If anyone other than the chosen employee works on it, or if an employee isn't chosen, a disease spreads throughout the entire facility, killing everyone. Sounds fairly easy, right? Well, Rose has chosen to work on the rose, which won't be confusing at all. They spend a lot of time hanging out with Ty, even going so far as to break some cookies out that were made with a special method, pollen and milk. Wowzers! They were also kept in a stasis chamber and frozen in time so that they could only break it out in a really special moment. Wow, so nice that Rose decided to share such a rare delicacy with their friend, ha 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 ha. Unfortunately, Cat rejects the offer, but Rose mentions that despite Cat not responding, they still make an effort to talk to them anyway. Ty naturally starts getting suspicious about all of this. They recruit Flower to help them out and break into the meeting room the department heads use. While there, they stumble on a half-finished faulty abno that looks like a gelatinous fetus. Gross! They also find the management materials for the Rose, which causes Ty to run off in a panic. They run into Shasha, who gives them permission to go see Rose despite their transgression. While spreading across the facility, Ty runs into Cat, who looks quickly away. Ty responds to this by slapping Cat full in the face, grabbing their hand, and dragging them along. Rose! I was the only one who could do it, that's all. But if only I could ask what's going on, and what's happened to you. Had I asked you just once, even if I'd be kicked by your shoes, I wouldn't be feeling so scared right now. I'm such a fool. I always have been. So... I actually don't like this sequence too much. Don't get me wrong, it's great in terms of being an excellent character drama moment, but well, let's just recap what happened here. So the Rose kills whoever works on it. Specifically, it needs an extremely high level employee to work on it and eventually die. The only two employees that can work on it are Rose and Cat, and because Cat is currently on their Joker arc, there's no way they'd agree to it. Shasha tells Rose as much and even offers them a deal. Rose's entire goal in the corporation was to move up in the ranks and eventually change how the main office works. Of course, we know exactly how well that would go, but no one else here really does. So Shasha suggests that Rose reject the command to work on the standing Rose. If they do, Shasha will immediately give Rose training that will eventually elevate them to the head of the department. Or Rose could accept the offer, betray their principles, and die a sacrificial lamb that has done nothing to change the status quo. They accept the order, but the reason why is the same thing that almost got Cat killed. Rose loves the people they've come to work with. That human connection is both the thing bolstering them and their determination, but it also demands that they sacrifice themselves for the sake of those that they love. So, Rose dies. Now let's take a second to be critical here for a moment. This is a great sequence for the characters. It's a terrible choice for the character that, up until this point, has basically been our MC. Ultimatums like this are always good to throw in there, as they really help rack up the tension for the audience. They also put your characters in a unique position that reveals their true character. However, this doesn't really feel like an abnormality, you know? Most of these abnos that have been introduced thus far could fit pretty squarely into the Lobcorp game, but Staining Rose feels less like a abnormality that exists as a game mechanic, and more like a physical plot device 
device that says kill Rose Lamau. This isn't some world ending tragedy that stops the comic from being good, but I feel like it's a flub that I can't help but address. With some slight tweaks, this could have very easily fit into the framework of how an abnormality works, but as it is, it feels like it was written purely for the sake of giving Rose an ultimatum. Again, this isn't some corrosive black mark on the comic, just a minor issue to point out. Also, how convenient is it that this damn thing takes a quote unquote while to have another agent fed to it because So, Lob Corp ended, the light is currently covering the entire city, and shockingly, good vibes are flowing. Everyone just kind of feels generally positive, like the bad things they've experienced are flowing off of them. Ty even gets an ego derived from Staining Rose, which instead of causing them to go on a roaring rampage of revenge because what the fuck that's morbid, they just sneak it home instead. So they settle down and get ready to rest in the glow of the light. Wait, what happened after the White Knights? Oh yeah, the dark days. Remember how everything was super positive and happy in the light? Not anymore. All that is replaced by anxiety and fear. Yay, thanks Angela. But this makes Ty realize something. During the light, they never saw Kat even once. So they set off to the corporation to find Kat. Speaking of, we kind of skipped a weird segment where Ty chased an abnormality around. It's not really an abno. The author has stated that it's the last fragment of Kat's humanity. Anyway, Kat is uh, not in a great way. They pray to the camera as they always have when things get rough but they realize that it's pointless to do so. The advice they received in the past was nothing but their own conclusion. When Kat asks the manager what they want their employees to do, the camera is silent as it always has been. In that silence, Kat is resolved to do what needed to be done long ago. In the darkness of the elevator as it rises, Kat fluctuates. On the top floor of the facility, they tear down the door to the manager's office, revealing Manuel sitting there and a desiccated corpse laying on the ground. The manager is dead. They have been this entire time. They fell in love with Manuel sometime in the past, but but a factory reset happened. The entity that the manager had fallen in love with had vanished, and in their despair, the manager ended their own life. Kat stands alone in the office. They say that they wish something could have been done, that their lives meant anything, that the human heart had some kind of consequence in the world, but it didn't. The heart was doomed to wither. It was doomed to twist and distort. The screens come alive. A voice speaks. It's beautiful, like sunshine. Kat changes. Elsewhere, Ty is walking through the city to get to 05681. It takes them a while, no one is outside, and the back streets smell like blood, so, you know, business as usual. They arrive at the facility only for a giant monster to burst through the ceiling. It's a fucked up Alice in Wonderland looking thing, complete with a teacup, hair, and hair. Ty is shocked to see an abno above ground, but has a moment of recognition. However, the rabbit opens a hole in the ground, which the Alice-like entity and Ty fall down into. As they fall, the rabbit declares that the party has begun. We cut to deep at the facility. Abnos are breaking free all over the place and the entire building is beginning to crumble. Two of the heads run into the Alice-like creature, which I'm now realizing isn't properly named in the story, so I'm just going to call it its name from now on. Two of the heads run into Party Everlasting. They try to get a reading of Inkafalin off of it so that they can tell how powerful of an abno it is. However, it's giving off absolutely nothing, meaning that this isn't an abnormality. The heads of the captains engage this strange entity. However, they're woefully unprepared, as Party Everlasting causes every abno in the facility to breach. The head of information, who I'm now realizing we never really talked about, uh, they were promoted like halfway through the comic, don't worry too much about it, stays behind to hold them off while the rest flee. Their captain stays as well to help them buy more time. Elsewhere in the facility, Joe, Shasha, and Daisy fight the breaching caterpillar in a last stand. Elsewhere again, Ella, Finn, and Flower are hiding in a containment unit. They express how they're glad they lived, even if they do regret the fact that they're probably going to die in the facility. But someone else is walking around outside of the unit. It's Ty, wearing the ego of the stained rose. Voices whisper from the darkened corridors of the facility as they approach Party Everlasting and call out its real name, Cat. Ty admits that Cat was right about everything. To survive in this strange wonderland, you really do have to abandon your humanity. Cat agrees, saying that at the end, they rejected everything. So now they party wondrous and everlasting. But this is where Ty denies Kat's words. Nothing lasts forever. Everything dies. It is impossible to survive forever. What truly matters is choosing how you end, like Rose did. In a burst of light, the stained Rose ego begins changing. Going from a pale white outfit with pink accents, something spreads within. Ty reaches into their heart and pulls from it a thorn. Blue spreads across the white, and they stand there in their ego, declaring that they will end this party finish this dance and save Cat. They fight. Ty easily outclasses this terrifying entity, dodging thrown arrows of light, growing a net of thorny vines to constrict the entity's movement, and taking a key moment to strike forward, piercing through the head of the monster and pulling Cat out of the other side. Ty speaks to the freed Cat, the shade of Rose alongside them. 
They say that the heart was never wrong. Surviving isn't the key. What truly matters is to show that no matter what, you always live to your utmost, so that someday, someone coming after you might unravel what was twisted. They fall. When they land, Cat is gone from Ty's arms. Despite their words, Cat stands and transforms back into Party Everlasting. The rabbit, which represents Cat's heart, calls out. The liquid Party Everlasting spread begins to swirl together, creating a bottomless whirlpool. Party leaps down into its depths. As it does, the rabbit says to Ty that they will never forget their name. All of the Abnos from the facility follow Party down into the swirling madness. In a desperate moment, Ty tries to follow, but it's too late. They're gone. The survivors meet on the surface. Turns out a decent amount of people made it out. The sacrifice of almost all the heads and one of the captains was enough to ensure that many employees could escape. But the world as they all knew it lay beneath them, below piles of rubble, gone. Time passes. Ella and Finn walk through the back streets trying to find a place called Bloom Office. They find it and Flower greets them. Turns out Flower and Ty got together to make something called a Fixer Office, with Ty as the main fixer. Apparently they've been getting a lot of requests for something called a Distortion Detective, which is a story for another time. However, Ty is unqualified for these requests. They're a fixer, not a detective. Although they don't say what grade they are, they have been making regular trips to the ruins searching for Cat. That is where we leave our story. Cat has left for Wonderland, but Ty still searches for them so they might find the traces of the human heart at the center of each abnormality, the traces that are left behind. They joyfully descend into Wonderland once again in search of all that perished yet never truly faded. Okay, that's the story of Wonder Lab, and please, for the love of God, don't cut away from now. I have some more things to say. This really was a roller coaster ride of emotions. While I did a good job of sprinkling in the critical stuff throughout the script, I'm still gonna take a bit to talk about my overall thoughts and impressions, things the story does really, really right, and places where there might be some shortcomings. What originally started as a comic that seemed to be pretty interested in showing off some cut content from LobCorp quickly evolved into a very compelling character drama. The art also goes through a lot of growth, with some really absurdly good moments in the late game. Like when Cat puts on the gift from Piscine Mermaid, the entire ending segment, and the final page especially. The use of space is also insanely good. I don't mean like in a comic layout way, although that is pretty good, but in a text way. Nothing is wasted here. Yeah, some sections are more interesting than others, but for the most part, every single line here is put there with intention. It's why this video is so long. There's almost no room for me to cut around the relationship building between our main trio. There's also a good amount of more funny moments, like Cat straight up throwing Ty out of a window so they can get out of the branch office. It's also got that characteristic Project Moon bittersweet ending that I just love. Yeah, things are resolved, and it's not necessarily a happy ending, but there's hope for the future, and that's most of what I've seen Project do in the past. There are, however, some issues. I've already made my thoughts on Staining Rose clear, but I also think things get really aggressively formulaic for a while. Every, and I mean every single ab node that gets introduced eventually breaches. Granted, that kind of has to happen because, you know, that's the plot. If the ab stays contained for the whole time, then where's the conflict of my story? However, part of the plot and the characterization of an Abno is how they breach containment, and the amount of effort put into how these Abnos breach varies pretty heavily as time goes on. Things like Tangle, Piscine Mermaid, White Lake, who we also forgot to talk about, and Servant of Wrath are all gone into really nice detail, but then you've got Road Home, which breaches because someone shared some food with it because it kept staring at them, and the breach at the training workshop, which is literally never elaborated on, just hand-waved with, wow, we got lax because other workers are here, when surely it would be the opposite because you've got competition now? In fact, the whole world workshop section is kind of not really important. It felt like there was a contractual obligation to show off no one is into Tanya, and everything was just built around the concept, then abandoned. The characters introduced are never brought up again, the breach just kinda happens, the character building moments get more fleshed out during the Twin Sisters segment right after, and worst of all, this super crazy powerful double a left tier aberration is just kinda buried under rubble after it happens. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad this segment exists because the two aberrations are really cool concepts, but they feel very much added on. The blue smocked shadow Shepard also feels this way, but to a lesser extent, and in a way that feels natural. The Shepard is the kind of character that would have probably killed Rose or Ty earlier on in the series, and while they do struggle with it, it is ultimately a footnote because this chapter is supposed to show that Ty and Rose are growing almost as strong as Cat. I kinda wish we got some spins on the breakout formula, and while it does improve over time, it kinda stagnates after the hook of Caterpillar incident. There are a few other things I'd like to talk about in terms of the presentation of the city after the information provided by Library of Runa, but we could talk about that at a later date. This is because I haven't made any content on library yet, so my general audience that isn't part of the cult will get spoiled from my speculations. I'm also not finished with library yet, so my speculations might get answered in the endgame. For now, my only vague comment is that manual existing is weird. 
However, none of these grumbles get in the way of the fact that this comic is fantastic. It's a look at another aspect of the world Project Moon has created. It's not a massive step forward like Library is, where the audience learns a lot about the wider world, but it is a look at the broader picture while still being from the perspective of Lobotomy Corporation, making this a perfect complementary piece bridging the gap between Lobotomy Corporation and Library of Rona. But others awaken from the dream to see the monsters for what they were. The monsters were people that got lost in the dream, who fell into nightmare and couldn't find their way out. They were not evil, but they were misguided. These people reach out to the monsters, diving into the darkest parts of the forest to seek out the glimmering spark of wakefulness that still resides in the heart of each monster. They seek, not for their own gain, but perhaps one day to bring those who were twisted back into clarity and to save those who need to be saved. Thank you for watching! I'm slowly coming up to the end game of Library on the Twitch stream. Specifically, I'm getting prepared to deal with the Reverb Conga line. We're also working our way through the extensive backlog of VODs on the other channel here on YouTube if you'd like to follow my completely blind journey through Library. We're also starting to upload Dark Knight's VODs on the YouTube as well. That way people can see my first time reactions to the story there. Oh yeah, this will also be the first video of the new year. I'd like to quickly thank you all for the massive support in 2022. I've never had a video do as well as the Lob Corp one, and that really has encouraged me to start putting way more effort into making content. My current goal is two videos a month, with this being the first and another Ark Knights video towards the end of the month. After that, hopefully I'll have finished LOR and we'll get to start making a few brief summaries for that. I'm also interested in making another video on the Project Moon spinoff content, but a lot of that content is in a weird way these days, so plans will be worked on at a later date. Also, Limbus is coming out sooner rather than later, and we're gonna be making a lot of content for that when it drops. Anyway, that's all for the update. Thank you all so much for watching once again, and I hope to see you soon. Peace! <laughs> they, the more they kept the monsters in cages, the more their eyes were buttered. Oh no. Well, unfortunately, it seems like Parker has forgotten one of the most important rules of working in the bottom of... Yes, my favorite place to work. As things calm down, Kat remarks that Bayozi was an idiot who attached silly meanings to a silly... I'm a silly boy. I'm playing Junkrat. I'm playing the silly man and throwing mines and getting instant kills. Wow, what a fun video game! So, Sasha suggests that Rose reject the command to work on the command... So, Shasha rejects. So, Shasha. So, Shasha. Jesus Christ, that is so hard to say. So, Shasha rejects. So, so, Shasha suggests that. So, Sasha rejects. Re not rejects. Suggests. So, Sasha suggests. So, Shasha suggests. So, Sasha suggests. That the human heart had some kind of consequence to the. <coughs> <coughs> The fuck that was going to read. <coughs> oh, fucking hell. To survive in this strange wonderland, you really do have to abandon your humanity. 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 I always have been. LOL. Uh. Oh my god, this fucking audio file is over an hour long. And I'm just making it longer. Oof.